love each and every one of you. And all the things I prepared are given right here, first and foremost. Our lesson this morning is going to be one that's going to come kind of from worldly things. And it's simply titled, The Complacent Christian. Now, this came, uh, I do a lot of online ministries. And this has come from things I've seen over this past week and maybe even in the last week. And I'll tell you, it's disturbing from the position of Christianity. But let's start where we all can think about things a little bit. We don't have to look very far, do we, to see that things aren't the way they're supposed to be in this world right now. We don't have to look very far to see that things aren't right when God is removed from them. And it seems like on a weekly basis, we get further and further away from what God wants us to do in this life. But where the problem lies is there the position of the Christian. The world and its ways is going to do what it's going to do, isn't it? The devil has a strong hold on a lot of folks' lives and some don't know God and they don't know his ways. But for those who do and do nothing is where the problem comes in. We don't have to look very far, as I said, to see that God has been removed from all things. People in life scream, God, get out of my schools. God, get out of my courthouses. God, get out of my home. But then when tragedy strikes, God, where are you? God, we need you. In a world where God wants to be removed off of everything from Prayers in a public place to taking him out, taking in God we trust off of our money. Don't we find it strange? And I thought about this when I was preparing this lesson. For a country and a world mostly that want God removed from everything. When you go to a courtroom before any testimony is entered, what do you do? You put your hand on the Bible, don't you? And you say, I affirm to tell the whole truth the, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Well, if God doesn't matter, if God needs to be removed, why is he still there? Same thing when we're swearing in a president. What do we do? He goes on this long ramble of a speech, doesn't he? When he's sworn in on that day of inauguration. He goes on saying he's going to protect our country, that he's going to do all things to help foreign and domestic. And what's the last words they have them utter? So help me God. You see, God is only wanted when it's ceremonial. God is only wanted when he's wanted by the world, when it's favorable to them. But it doesn't work like that, does it? And in our Christian life, folks, we know better. I heard a couple of stories this past week that A, were shocking, and B, were laughable. First of all, there is a congregation... Down south, I believe it was Arkansas. Me and my wife saw this. <laughs> and there was a preacher that was up in a stadium-like facility. Thousands, maybe, of people. He's got his microphone. He's sweating. He's really going after it, preaching and screaming and hollering. And as he gets into his sermon, he begins to tell this crowd that having a beard as a man leads you to being proud. Having a beard leads you to being proud and can lead to sin. Well, I hate to inform you folks, but most of the folks in the Bible that we read every day had a beard. It's the most ridiculous thing you ever heard. And instead of someone calling him on it, instead of someone doing anything about it, they applauded and cheered as loud as they could. And you know what? He cheered with them and clapped for himself. This is where we are. And to make matters even crazier, this past week, I don't know if you've seen this whole story about this J.K. Rowling's thing, the author of those book series, the Harry Potter series. Most children read those and things like that. Well, she came out and made a comment about not being for trans rights, for transgenders. Now, don't get me wrong, she is mostly liberal in her views in this world. 
She is a very, very liberal person in her thinking. But on this issue, she came out and said that she doesn't believe that there should be transgenders because it ruins and skews the identities of male and female. There needs to be a separation and the sexes need to have an identity. Well, it didn't take long. You can imagine what happened. People took to the internet. They took to the streets. They took everywhere and they've been coming after her with vengeance for the last week and a half, maybe two weeks. The person that was once championed by them has now become their greatest enemy. But what shocked me, that doesn't really surprise me, but what does surprise me is the position that Christians have taken on this issue. I cannot tell you how many places I have seen this past week where the Christians are siding with the transgenders. They're siding with them and saying, how dare she make such bigotry comments about transgenders? Christians. I hate to inform you folks, but if we as Christians take the side of transgenders, that way of thinking basically is saying that when God created those people, he made a mistake. If you support transgenders, you are taking the side that God is fallible and made a mistake when those people were born. Well, we know better, don't we? 1 Corinthians 6 and 19 tells us that our body is not our own. But it's the temple of the Holy Ghost which was given to you of God. No, rest assured, God didn't make a mistake when you were born. But Christians should know better, shouldn't they? The complacent Christian, though. Today, Christianity a lot of times doesn't want to take the position of standing for God and standing on His Word. And so therefore we bow a knee to what's going on in the world. If we do that, folks, we are in for a very, very dangerous end because we only bow a knee to one, and that's God. And that's the way it should be. But somewhere along the way, too many people have let too many things go by and done nothing. And then we have the world that we have now. As Christians, we must stand on God's word. We must stand for what's right. We must exhort when it's necessary. Because if we don't, these things are not going to change. They're only going to be more and more accepted. What's the old expression? Give an inch and they take a mile. This morning we're going to see the dangers of being a complacent Christian. And what our own Savior, not just a disciple, has to say about it. Having said that, we go into our first point. Number one, I have written here that complacency makes us lazy. Yes, as a Christian, if we do not do what God expects us to do, we are going to have a very severe, severe punishment. If you want to follow on, most of our lesson day, uh, kind of conveniently, is all in Matthew, the 25th chapter. We're going to start in verses 14 to 30. Now here Christ gives us a parable and he says that there was a certain man that was getting ready to travel off into a far country. But before he did, he called his servants in and was going to give them his goods to watch over and take care of while he was gone. First, he brought the first servant in and he gave him five talents or five pieces of money. He gave the next one two and the last one one. And I love here it says how he gave to each man as their own several ability. So this man knows what each person was capable of. So he gave the one that was the most capable five, one that was moderately capable two, and the one that was least one. And he travels off, doesn't he? He goes off to that far country. While he's gone, the one he gave five to takes those five and gains five more beside of them. The one that gained two gains two more, and the one that was given one decides to dig into the ground, dig into the earth, and bury the one that was given to him because he was afraid. 
So, on a certain day, unbeknownst to them, they have no idea when he was coming back, the Lord shows up. The man comes back and he calls his servants in and wants to see what they've done why he was gone. Well, the first one comes forward and says, Lord, you gave me five talents and I've gained five beside of them while you were gone. And the Lord is pleased. And he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, but I will make you a ruler over many. Likewise, he brings the second one in and he says, I've gained two more, Lord, beside what you gave me. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. And finally, here comes the one that was given the one. And he says, Lord, I was afraid because I knew you were wrathful. I knew that you took vengeance upon those who went out of their way, did not do what you asked. And I was afraid. So I dug in the earth and I buried what you gave me. And now I bring it back to you. Immediately, Immediately, this angers the Lord. He says, thou wrathful, thou slothful servant. You could have at least taken what I gave you, gave it to the exchangers for usury, but you did nothing. So I'm going to take what was given to you and give it to the one who gained ten. You will be cast into outer darkness and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We take a lot of things away from us. At least we should as a Christian. The whole 25th chapter of Matthew is from our Savior's lips and the entire chapter is on us as a Christian and what our responsibility needs to be. This story is a great illustration. We obviously see that in the story, the Lord is God. The servants are us. And the talons or the pieces of currency represent the talents that God gave us. You know what we see from this as a takeaway? Every single person has at least one talent. One God-given talent that you should be putting to use for your Almighty. The question to us is, are we? And another thing we take away from this, a lot of times we focus on the one that gave five, or the gained five. And we think, wow, that guy was the best. But look, as you read the story, was the Lord or God in this story not just as pleased with the one who only gained two as the one who gained five? Would he had not been just as happy with the man who get, was given one if he gained one more beside him? You see, in this life, sometimes people have many talents, don't they? Multiple talents. Maybe they're a writer. Maybe they can do many multiple different things at the same time. They go to work. They raise a family. But what we find from this story is God has given every single person in this world a talent to be used for God. And if it's not used for God, we also see how angry this makes the Lord. Didn't take very long, did it? He was very quick to give credit and to give praise to those who went and did what God wanted them to do. Went and gained for the Lord. But he was just as quick to be angry at that slothful servant who did nothing. That's the point, isn't it? The slothfulness... He had all this time to do even the most basic thing. The Lord in the story says, you could have given what I gave you to the exchangers for interest, for usury. But you absolutely did nothing for me while I was gone. The question to us as a Christian is, are we doing the same? When we see things need done out there, we see exhortation needs done, people need help, are we sitting on our faith? Are we keeping it to ourselves? What good is it doing? If we go through this life and we come through those doors every single Sunday, sit in these pews, sing songs of praise, read God's Word, grow every single day in our life, are these all great things? Yes. 
But what good is it doing us if we keep it to ourselves and it dies with us? Is it helping our children? Is it helping our grandchildren? Is it helping someone out there? The answer is no. Complacency as a Christian leads to us being lazy. Leads to us thinking about us and only us and not doing a single thing to advance the kingdom of God in this world. That's what complacency can do. It can lead to becoming a lazy Christian. One who goes through the motions and just worries about us and what we need to do and how we need to get to heaven and cross the finish line. And we don't consider anybody else. And that's what leads into our second point. Number two, I have written here, complacency harms others. Doesn't just harm us, but we're going to see how it harms others. We stay in the same chapter, Matthew 25, this time verse 31 to 46. Once again, Christ gives us another great depiction of what the last day of judgment is going to be like. We're told there that the Lord is going to return with the holy angels. And he's going to divide all of those in this world to his right and to his left. The sheep and the goats. On the right are the sheep. Those who willingly followed his word did what he was supposed to do. Those that were righteous. And on the left are the goats. Those that didn't do what he wanted. Those who didn't care about him and didn't lead a godly life. We're told first that he's going to call those, the sheep on his right, forward. And he's going to say, well done. For I was a hunger and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. And I was in prison and you came unto me. And the righteous are going to say, Lord, when did we see you and do all these different things? And he says, as you've done it unto the least of one of these, you've done it unto me. Simply put, as you've done it to the least of those out there, those who truly and genuinely needed your help every single time you've reached in your back pocket and given money to somebody who needed help, you've done it unto the Lord. Every single time you have visited somebody that was sick and in the hospital and needed encouragement, it's as if you did it unto the Lord. Because he's watching every single action and move you do or didn't do. Is that us? Are we the sheep? If the sound of the trump would come tonight and Christ would return, which side of the Lord are we going to be on? Are, go, are we going to be on the right side of the Lord or are we going to be on the left? The person that didn't quite get things done because the story finishes by saying that those on the left are going to be called forward and he's going to tell them the same thing. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger and you never took me in. I was naked and you never gave me clothes. I was sick and you never came to visit me. And I was in prison and you never came unto me. And they answer by saying, Lord, when, when did we not do these things? He said, as you have not done it unto the least of these, you didn't do it to me. Does it come any plainer to us as Christians of what complacency can do, not only to us, but to those around us? By us being selfish and not doing what we're supposed to do, it's costing us our soul. It's costing us our chance at eternal life, but it's also costing those around us. Because we don't have to look too far to see people that need help in this life. And they need help in a lot of ways. It isn't just monetarily. It's giving of our time. Giving of ourself. Because that's what a Christian is, isn't it? It's to be selfless. To do what our Savior asked us to do. And it, the example that He set before us. Did He take a day off? Did He take a sick day? Did he take a day where he said, oh, that blind guy, I'm not going to heal him today. I got enough to do. Those people over there that need to be taught God's word, not today. I got other things I need to get to. He didn't, did he? And he's the example we all follow. 
But being the complacent Christian or being the person in life who's just happy to be doing the bare minimum, this is the result. The result is you ending up on the wrong side of the Lord. The result is you finishing your life and you didn't do anything. You didn't help anybody but yourself. It harms others. Complacency doesn't just harm us. It harms others. And that's what this story illustrates. And we go from being complacent and leading us to be lazy, being complacent, harming others, and folks, we finish up in number three, by our complacency leads to accountability. This is where today's world and where we began this lesson comes into play. You see, in this life, we have to stand for God's word. Because once again, if we don't, it's harming not only us, but those around us. I'm going to give you three verses. And we're going to talk about each one and how it relates to our Christian accountability when it comes to being complacent in God's word. First of all, sometimes in our life, even as Christians, we use the excuse I have written here of judgment. The excuse of looking at someone and saying they're never going to listen to me. That person frequents the bar every Friday night. They do this and that through the week. They're not even going to listen to me. What's the point? Or this person that does this or that in their life, they're never going to be a Christian. And withholding teaching them about God's Word, withholding doing Christian acts to them, because maybe you don't agree with what they do in life. What does this road lead to? Well, James tells us in James 4 and verse 17, For him to knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Accountability comes back on us, doesn't it? For us to take the form of judgment and say, I'm not going to help this one or that one. I'm not going to take a stand for God's word and do what I need to do because they're not going to listen. Their lifestyle is counter to it. So we might as well just love them and do nothing. No exhortation, no standing up for what's right. No doing anything. Just love them, fade into the background, and decide to do nothing. Or judge and say they're never going to listen anyway. And prejudge. Boy, we're pretty good, aren't we? If we can judge the hearts of men, their mindset, we're pretty good. We're doing way good if we can do that before we even talk to them. If we take that mindset, folks, not only are we not standing for God's Word, but we're prejudging folks and we're never going to win over a soul. And if we take that stand and stay in that stand, it comes back on us. For him to know it, to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. Isn't that as plain as it gets? There's no more plain verse in God's word, is there, than that? For you to, or for me to stand by and know that something needs to be done to help someone. Something needs to be done to stand up for God's word and us to stay closed lipped and do nothing. It comes back on us. You know, a lot of times in this life when we think about the judgment day, we think about our life coming to an end, taking that knee before the judgment seat of Christ. We always think about what we do. Well, I'm going to be judged on whether I did this and whether I did that. Things I shouldn't have done. You know, the most overlooked thing for Christians on the judgment day is the things we didn't do. Not just what we did against the name of God, because we probably repented of those things a lot of times. The things that's going to get us that we don't even think about are the things we didn't do. The forks in the road in your life that come by on a daily basis. When you decide or don't decide to talk to somebody about God. And God saw the action you took. The time where you heard something or saw something going on that you knew was contrary to God, but you didn't want to get involved because you didn't want people to think a certain way about you, or you were just too afraid, or had doubt or certain things take over your life, that was a decision. 
And these are the decisions that are going to get us if we do not start taking a stand for God. We cannot afford to be a complacent Christian because we're going to have to account for not only things we do, but the things we don't do. And we go on. Next, I have written here number two. We take the excuse of standing by or, well, if I don't get involved, I'm not harming anything. You see, I, if I don't get involved, then I'm not harming my reputation out in the world, but I'm also not harming anything because I didn't do nothing. I just was neutral, see? Does that not describe the Christian faith in this world today? Be neutral. Don't get involved. Even when you know things aren't right, even when you know things are contrary to God's word, just don't get involved. Just be neutral. Well, if we are, and if we're afraid of what people are going to think of us, if we do jump in our reputation, once again, we're accountable. Jesus Christ, in his own words, tells us in Mark, the 8th chapter, verse 38. And tell me if this doesn't sound familiar to today. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he returns with his holy angels and God. That pretty well sums it up, doesn't it? Our Savior is simply telling us in the simplest form that he possibly can, that if you're ashamed of me, you're ashamed of your faith, you're ashamed to stand up for what I stood for, that I'm going to be ashamed of you when your life comes to an end. There will be a day of accountability for those who willingly stand by and do nothing. We cannot afford to be a complacent Christian. And folks, finally, in our accountability, words we know well, and words that are, to me, the ones that drive me as a Christian more than any I believe in the entire New Testament. Once again, from our own Savior's mouth, a lot of times we think of the loving things that Christ did, and He did. And you think about that Sermon on the Mount that goes through Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7. But look how He ends the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. Here He tells us in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, that not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. There will be many on that day that say, Lord, did we not do many good things in thy name? Lord, did we not cast out devils? And I'm going to answer and say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity, or rather sin. Isn't that the most chilling words that any Christian could ever hear in their entire lifetime? is to live your lifetime, think you're doing enough, but finding out you didn't. Accountability. If we're complacent, these are the words we're going to hear. If we're complacent as a Christian and don't need do what Christ asked us to do, we're going to hear, I never knew you because you didn't do what I told you to. I'm going to end with a story. At the scene of an accident, when you get on the interstate or anything, there are three people that show up to that accident. The first people are the cops, and their job is to come, assess the damage, and assign blame, or rather judgment, on who's at fault. The second group of people that arrive to that accident or are at that accident are the standers by. Those who rubberneck, those who look at, the, look at the damage but decide not to get involved. They're just there to see what happened and see the damage. And folks, finally, there's the EMTs. They don't have the ability and don't have the time to judge or assess judgment. They don't have time to stand by. They're simply there to save a life. Which one are we? Because, folks, if we're not the MT, if we're not trying to save souls, trying to save lives, and trying to steer people away from things that are ungodly, we're wasting our time. 
if we deny the chance for eternal life to people in this life, then when ours comes to an end, we're going to be denied. Which one are we? Today in our Christian life, can we honestly say we are a complacent Christian? Or are we doing what our God and our Savior asked us to do? It's up to us. The lesson's yours. If there's anyone here this morning, I believe we're all baptized. But if anyone's here this morning and has heard these words and has been moved to need to repent, there are faithful men here to pray that you come back and be restrengthened with your God before it's eternally too late. If you have that need, won't you come as we sing the song of invitation? <laughs>